Hi, I'm Sean Conway, and welcome to Cultivating Life. This week's show is all about butterflies. We'll be planting a garden to attract butterflies, grilling butterfly shrimp, and visiting an exotic butterfly zoo. Welcome to Cultivating Life. This week's show is all about butterflies. We'll be planting a garden to attract butterflies, grilling butterfly shrimp, and visiting an exotic butterfly zoo. Stick around, I think you'll enjoy what's to come. And remember, reconnecting to the land is as simple as stepping out your back door. Yesterday. Plants like this beautiful Eupatorium or Joe Pieweed are great at attracting butterflies to my garden. And I've been wanting to put in more plants to do just that. And Bill Kalina from New England Wildflower Society has brought with him today some beautiful plants that will attract butterflies to the garden. But Bill, this is really more than just planting these plants. It's a twofold proposition, isn't it? Yeah, you want to have plants that will feed the butterflies, of course, and bring them in. But it's also important to think about feeding the caterpillars, because without caterpillars, there are no butterflies. butterflies. Right. So I, I brought a selection of plants here. Most of these are good nectar plants, because that's what the adults are looking for, that sweet nectar. But I've also bought some plants that are food sources for the caterpillars as well. So there's really two reasons why butterflies would come to your garden. One is to get something to eat, and the other is to lay eggs to, to right. propagate their species. Right. Let's start with this one, because I know this plant. This is milkweed. And yeah. Not the common form that maybe everyone has seen. Tell us about this. This is, this is called swamp milkweed. It is a swamp species. Although it grows just in a regular perennial border, it would grow over there with the Joe Pye weed, too. This is about a three-foot high plant, blooms in summertime. And it's one of the plants that the monarch butterfly caterpillars can feed on. And just a little bit earlier, we were watching the monarch. There's a little egg right there. Bill, what are some other host plants besides the Asclepias for attracting butterflies? Strangely enough, many woody plants are really the best for the caterpillars. So plants like spice bush, many of the dogwoods are good for attracting butterfly caterpillars. Really? And so planting a mix of woody plants and, and perennial flowers and shrubs to, to really bring in the butterflies is really the best bet. Milkweeds are sort of uh, insidious in that this is a little spring trap inside this flower. So when the butterfly's leg slips inside there, it snaps shut on the leg and holds it for a little while while it glues pollen onto there oh and then gosh. lets it go. So it's easy to get shots of butterflies on milkweeds because if you're a photographer there. because they're <laughs> trapped there. So it's another incentive to plant some in your garden. That's funny. Now what about this? This is Vernonia? Yeah, this is the New York ironweed, which is uh, typically a, a big plant. Huge, I mean, yeah. this will get six, eight, ten feet high even. Uh, and it, it blooms in late summertime. It's in the aster family, so it has these big flat clusters, lots of little flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the sort of thing that butterflies like, the landing pad that the Joe Pye weed is, so they can land on it, and then lots of little places they can go to drink, lots of little tubular places they can drink. So things like that are really great for uh, bringing in the adult butterflies. Okay, now what about this with this great fragrant leaf? I love this plant. Yeah, this is mm -hmm. a uh, Agastache or Agostache, depending on how you, you want to pronounce it, called a uh, black adder. And this is actually a hybrid. The interesting thing about this particular hybrid is it doesn't set any seed. And so oh. it blooms all summer long into the fall. So it's one of the best nectar producing plants. Now, what about this? Yeah, black that's a Susan. plant that everybody recognizes, the black eyed Susan, and certainly an excellent for attracting lots of the big charismatic butterflies, the monarchs and the swallowtails and things like that. They love coming in here because even though this looks like one big flower, these are the, uh, the sterile or the ray flowers, and all the fertile flowers are in this. So again, lots of little flowers that the butterflies can feed on over a long period of time. Now, what about this, Bill? This is Pycnanthemum, which is in the mint family. Yeah. And it smells incredibly It's got a beautiful good. smell, like yeah. most mints. This is a cultivar called Cat Springs, which doesn't spread quite as much as many of them do. A lot mm -hmm. of these will spread pretty aggressively. But the great thing about mountain mints is they bloom over a really long time. Yes, so right. not only for attracting butterflies, but all kinds of nectar feeding insects. They're really great. And they'll just keep going and going at lots of these little flowers. Bill, yeah. what about this tall spiky plant here? This is a plant many people are familiar with as a florist plant, although it's an excellent garden perennial too. This is gay feather or blazing star Liatris pycnostachia, it's called. And it's interesting that it blooms from the top down. And this is the reverse of what most plants yeah. do. But it's uh, another excellent species for attracting butterflies. I have lots of pictures of swallowtail butterflies feeding on these. 
Bill, this is terrific, and I can't wait to put these in my garden and sit back and watch <laughs> the butterflies swarm. So thanks very much. Okay, great. Thanks, John. You know, nothing's more beautiful than seeing a butterfly float through a field. But if you look at them up close, you'll find they're much more intricate than you ever imagined. And with me here today is Cindy Train, who's going to show me how to make a butterfly observation cage. Now, what are you doing now? You're... Uh, well, what we're going to do is, um, is use these parts that I have on the table. This is a, if you hold that down for a minute, this is a washer top used for making lampshades. Oh, okay. And what we're going to do is cover the top of this with tulle. Tulle is this very lightweight netting. What we're going to do is cover the top of this with this square piece that we have. And then we're going to wrap around the outside of it this curtain. And on the bottom of the curtain here, I'm putting some weighted tape. This okay. is used in drapery making. So I'm just finishing gluing the bottom here. Just a thin bead of glue and then lay the tool edge on top of it. Now let's put the tool on the top part of this washer top. I'm going to put a little bead of glue around the edge. And then if we both hold the corners here, we can lay this on top and keep it pretty flat. We're going to trim it all off the corners once it's dry. You just run the scissors right along the edge. If you have a little extra tool hanging over the edge it's no it's okay. problem and so right here i'm just making a little cross and then that threaded rod goes through and that'll give us something to hold on to when we glue on the skirt to this okay. i used an 18 inch washer top for this you could use a smaller one and the tool is uh about 10 inches longer than the circle All right. so that it can overlap. Okay, so okay. We're, we're essentially making like a shower curtain around a cloth foot bathtub. That's right, yeah. If you want to glue, and then we can just wrap it around the edge. Don't want to stretch too much. Great. Perfect. Super. Okay. So just yeah, hold on to this for a minute while it dries. And then we just need a ribbon to hang it from, and then we'll put a plant inside. And watch your butterflies for hours and then release them back into the wild. Yeah. Well, Cindy, thank you very much for showing me a very simple and fun technique to give us more time for observing butterflies. Zoos introduce us to all sorts of unusual animals. And for the Bronx Zoo's Diana Tancredi, butterflies have held her interest since childhood. The Bronx Zoo is an introduction to wildlife for a lot of urban children, myself included. When you grow up in an inner city, you often don't get an opportunity to view any type of wildlife, birds, butterflies, plants, tigers, lions, bears, um, anything that they might read about in a storybook as they're growing up. Um, for the most part, we have a lot of children that come here, and this is their first introduction to those animals. It's pretty amazing. A visit to the exhibit gives us some surprising information. The myth that a butterfly will die if you touch its wings is a, is a myth. Um, you don't want to touch their wings uh, because they are covered in, in scales. If you take all the scales off of a butterfly's wings, it's actually clear, it's transparent. You can see right through it. Lepidoptera means scaly wing. That's how butterflies and moths are grouped because they have scales on their wings. That's what gives the butterflies their distinct colors and coloration. Some are through true color and some are through just the, the reflection and refraction of light. And color serves a purpose for these beautiful insects. A lot of toxic butterflies tend to be black and orange for some reason, but um, we have several species like the milkweed butterflies, the monarch and the queen. As caterpillars, they will eat the milkweed plant and they get a toxin from that which carries over into their adult phase and uh, they're distasteful so usually if a bird eats one it probably won't kill them but they'll get sick and then they'll remember that color pattern and say oh, I don't want to eat those anymore so um, that that usually gives them some measure of protection from predators the life cycle of the butterfly is complex and almost magical butterflies go through a process called metamorphosis and they have four stages they start as an egg, they become a caterpillar. Uh, the caterpillar transforms into what's known as a pupa or a chrysalid, and then they go into the adult stage that we know, which is the actual butterfly. When they emerge from the, the chrysalis, it takes roughly an hour for their wings to unfold and dry. After they emerge in the husbandry room, we put them in what's called a release cage, and we'll bring them out and let them out into the greenhouse. Butterflies in general require 
vitamins, minerals, and whatnot, ju just like people do. They get a lot of their requirements from the nectar. What they don't get from the nectar, they can get from what's called puddling. It's been said that the males need to puddle more than females because it helps with their reproductive <laughs> success. So um, a lot of times when you see lots of butterflies on a moist sort of small puddle or a moist area of ground, and they're just trying to pick up moisture and some nutrients and salt. So anything pretty much you can think of that's a liquid, a butterfly will try it. And just like the plants they depend on, butterflies require the sun's energy. Butterflies are cold-blooded, which means they cannot make their own body heat like a human would. They are very dependent on external heat sources. Their body temperature should be somewhere around 75 to 80 degrees in order for them to fly. So they'll do a behavior called basking. They'll come out in the morning and they'll spread their wings in order to pick up the sun's rays to get that heat. They will fly on a non-sunny day, somewhat like today, uh, if the temperature is warm enough. Uh, we find that it has to be at least 65 degrees outside. Observing these beautiful insects, one realizes that butterflies take us into another world. We call butterflies our ambassador species for insects because they are generally viewed as friendly and non-threatening as opposed to, say, a wasp or a mosquito. People feel like they can come in here and they can learn. So while we're trying to teach them about butterflies, we're also trying to connect the butterflies to other insects so that um, people can be a little more insect friendly and realize that although they may not be as pretty as a butterfly, um, they may not be as friendly as a butterfly, that they're still very, very important to the environment. They're very important to humans. Flowers and butterflies are not only beautiful, sometimes they inspire us to make beautiful things. And Adriana Yoto is here to show me how to make these beautiful garden applique pillows. Hello, Adriana. Hi. At one time, orchids were considered exotic plants and very difficult to find. Now you can get them at your local grocery. And here to show me how to keep them looking good and to get them back into bloom is Bill Kalina, orchid expert. Hi, Bill. Hi, Sean. Now, it's true that these, when you get them, usually look really wonderful when they're in full bloom. But the trick is to get them back into bloom after they've gone by. The nice thing about these moth orchids is they do make great house plants, and you can keep them going for years and years and years, but a little bit of timely maintenance is important. You just want to make sure you repot them regularly so that they don't get to the point where they, uh, they can't recover. One thing about these moth orchids is you never want to cut the flower stems off until they've turned totally brown. That's the first thing. Because this one is, has turned sort of brown, but when I look up here on this stem, I can see some buds mm -hmm. coming out, and these will grow out and bloom again. So this one's still going to be blooming. But once it's turned completely brown like this, it's going to take another six months or so for it to come along again and flower. Bill, these orchids are epiphytic, but what exactly is that? Epiphytic just means that they grow on trees. They grow in the branches of trees, because in the rainforest, where these are native to, that's where a lot of the light is. If you think about what would happen in the trees, there is a soaking rain, and they take up a lot of water. And then there's periods where there isn't any rain, and so they almost have to be like cacti in that sense, and just holding their own until it rains again. So this drenching of water, and then a little bit dry, and drenching of water, and a little bit dry, is really the ideal way you want to take care of them and water them. Bill, why don't we transplant this orchid since it needs okay. it? And I've got some orchid mix right here that we can use. This one's got charcoal, some of them have moss. Depending on the kind of plant you're growing, how much you water, you can adjust basically how much, uh, how much of this big material, like these big chunks of bark, which obviously drain quite Quickly. well. And if you tend to water a lot, uh, you want to add a lot of those. And if you uh, water less, then you can use a mix with more of these fine particles in there, which will hold more. This is a good you know, general purpose compromise here that we have that's got a little of everything. With these plastic pots, it's kind of nice because you can squeeze the pot a little bit, uh -huh. and that uh, loosens it up from the, uh, the medium, uh, the, the walls of the pot, so you can get it out. This one is, is, uh, is slipping out, and you can see um, that there are some live roots here, and there's actually the, some you know, new root growth on these mm -hmm. tips, so it's, it's, not, it's not too grim for this plant. I'm going to cut these flower stems off, unfortunately. All right, let me get a scissors. Um, even though it is about to send out more flowers, just because the, the stress of, of repotting. One thing that's important with orchids is there are viruses out there that 
that will get into the plant through dirty cutting shears and that sort of thing, and they ah. can really debilitate the plant. Whenever you're doing anything with orchids, it's good to just sterilize them with alcohol, or, or, or you can put them, use a blowtorch actually to sterilize them. It seems a little extreme, but when you see a plant go down with the virus, it makes it it's worthwhile. All worthwhile. So, right. uh, so we'll cut these off. And uh, get them out of the way. And then okay. what we're trying to do is work the chunks of bark down inside the, the root system, not to just press it all in so the root system gets packed in the middle. Okay, a little more. The root that's outside of the pot here, mm -hmm. um, the, the funny thing about these orchid roots is the ones that grow out into the air are different than the ones that are down in the pot. Once they start growing out of the air, if you tuck this one down inside, it wouldn't do very well. So it's better actually to cut this off oh, and let it okay. and let it rebranch. Now, should you water it in after it's been transplanted like this? You really should take it to the sink and drench it a couple of times to try to get the bark uh, dampened up. Uh, what I typically do with these is leave them out uh, when the temperatures start dropping down into the 50s uh, regularly at night for a couple of weeks. That triggers them to start to form new flower spikes. Well, I do think they're they're wonderful plants and certainly well worth um, the cost because they give you so much in return. And Bill, thanks very much for giving me tips on how to keep my orchids looking good and getting them to bloom year after year. My pleasure. Butterflying seafood or meat is a great way to cut down on cook time, but it also gives you extra surface area for a great tasting sauce. Right, Jackie? That's right, Sean. Now, we're butterflying shrimp. Yep, these really are very quick to do. We have some shrimp ready for the grill, okay. and we're just going to butterfly them. Okay. Now, what about taking out the... Uh... The vein? Yeah. Yeah, and that's the first step of butterflying the shrimp anyway. So we just cut in the back slightly and that's when the vein will come out it usually it. sticks to the knife okay. as well i kind of do all that prep first okay. and then give the shrimp a good wash and then they're very quick to cook we just split it just deeply uh-huh and then it's just going to sit like this nice and even when it cooks it will curl up a little more because this is so quick and and you know it's just a matter of seconds, seconds on the grill right we're going to make our chimichurri sauce from argentina okay and it's going to have a lot of parsley so we're going to put a really generous handful in our blender. OK. Let that sort of chop up pretty finely first. OK. And then followed by a couple of cloves of garlic. Garlic really gives it a good bite, too. Sure. And a, a generous handful of spring onions. And you can also use shallots, if you like. Great. And a, a good pinch of salt. And estimate about half a cup of olive oil as well. OK. And then I like the lemony taste, especially if I've got quite a lot of um, spice from the garlic. So that can go in as well. And then we'll just give it a good blend. You can add some thyme, okay. maybe a little basil. Again, I just kind of avoid the stalks because that will make it um, a little bitter. So then we can just blend that up. OK. It smells good already. It, it really jazzes up to simple grilled food. It's a beautiful color. Isn't it beautiful? Mm. And it smells magical. Mmm, it does. And it's always good to have a little taste just to make sure it's all balanced. Okay. And it's perfect, spot on. Mm, very it's great. Good. I've oiled the grill with a little olive oil. Okay.